Hi everyone, I'm Eleanor Shano, and we have so much good stuff to cover in the next half hour. I'm gonna get started right away. First, we are going to dispel a lot of those myths about growing older with one of the top aging researchers in the country. And did you know that river cruises are the rage these days? We're going to show you why they're becoming the hottest ticket. And Pittsburgh Steelers, well, doesn't look like we're going to the Super Bowl this season, but author Jim O'Brien is with us with his latest book. Yep, it's all about Steelers stuff. We're gonna get you connected to those topics and more next on LifeQuest. We're lucky it happens to all of us. We grow older, minute by minute, second by second. And even though there is no way to turn back the clock, there are ways to slow the aging process. And the best place to begin is by dispelling a lot of the myths. And the man to do it, well, he's right here. His name is Dr. Neil Resnick. He is the chief of the Division of Geriatric Medicine at UPMC, and welcome to you. Thank you. I am um, so excited to learn, and I did not know this, that there is more research on aging done right here in good old Pittsburgh than anywhere in the country, maybe in the world. It's actually true. There was a national study done two years ago of all the research that's funded by the National Institutes of Health on Aging, and we rank number one. Okay, you were brought in from Harvard to, to head up this division of medicine at UPMC. Do you think that growing older is, is just a reason for a lot of excuses that people make? I mean, as soon as they decide they don't want to do something, they go, well, I mean, I'm not as young as I used to be, or at my age. Do you think there's any truth to that? It's absolutely true. My 30-year-old college roommate told me that at 30 now, he couldn't do anything that he used to, and this aging stuff was really tough. But more pernicious, I think, is what I heard recently from a commentator saying that how could Nancy Pelosi come in with such energy when she's a 66-year-old grandmother, completely forgetting <laughs> that Sophocles <laughs> wrote Oedipus when he was 90, <laughs> and that Frank Lloyd Wright designed all those museums and, and falling water in his 80s, so absolutely uh, true. How about, the, it, how about the baby boomers, though? That, that, that huge tidal wave, do you see that tidal wave of human beings who are now approaching retirement age, do you see this creating a, a, a new age of aging in America? Absolutely. It's interesting. We're aging better than we ever have in history. So if, at any <laughs> I don't given... I what that means. That's kind, of a, that's kind of a catchy statement. We are aging better. We are. At, at age 80, we will be the healthiest group of 80-year-olds in the history of the Earth. But because there's so many more 80-year-olds at that point, there will still be plenty of people who need care, even at age 80, even if, it, if 90 becomes the current 70. But it seems that the baby boomers have paid a little more attention to, to lifestyle issues than a lot of us did in earlier generations. Uh, they've been more aware of the importance of good nutrition and exercise and not smoking and, and all of those things. So do you think that's going to, to change a, a lot of the way medicine is practiced? Absolutely. We hope it will. Uh, I, in fact, I think of it as SOS, smoking and being overweight and sedentary. Those are the three biggest risk factors to accelerate the aging process. And the fact that most people have tried to avoid those has been very helpful. The problem is it's, it's opposed increasingly by overeating and the increased associated risk of diabetes. And so how we age and what will happen is really up to ourselves at this point. I hope there's no one out there that was hearing what you said sitting on the sofa with a Krispy Kreme in one hand and a cigarette in the other because you, <laughs> you really gave them a double whammy. That's it. Smoking, obesity, and sedentary. sedentary. Absolutely. Okay. Is it true that if we live long enough, we will eventually, eventually suffer from some disease? Yes, it is true. Um, it turns out that half of 65-year-olds have at least three chronic conditions and a, 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 of people over 65. And of people who are over 65, a quarter have five or more conditions. But the healthier you live and the more that you detect conditions earlier and risk factors, the mm -hmm. less chance you have of getting the diseases. And if you do, the more we can do about them because we pick them up early. How are we doing in America? Um, are, are we doing enough 
in the way of, of getting the message out about prevention and uh, lifestyle and, and all of the things that will make a difference. Are we doing enough? Do we have anything to learn from any other countries, um, any other countries where people are living longer or better lives? Unfortunately, we probably do, but we don't know what we have yet to learn. There are other countries with more old people who seem to be doing th some things better, but, but not others. We do know that prevention is still considered in this country an oxymoron, that you can't be old and talk about preventive medicine, yet it turns out paradoxically we can do more to prevent illness for old people than we can for young. It's never too late to start. We, it is that, never. You know, we keep preaching that on this show, that it is not too late to start. It's not too late to get out of the chair and move a little bit. Absolutely. It's not too late to change your eating habits. Too much attention placed on good genes, in your opinion? Yes. Um, there is such a thing as having good genes, but I guess there are two things about that. First, it's too late to worry about it now. Mm -hmm. Right? And second, even if you don't have the good genes, you can still do a lot to make your aging healthy. Okay, metabolism slows down. We hear this all the time. You have to gain weight because your metabolism slows down. True, false? It is true, but most of metabolism is governed by how much muscles we have and how strong they are. So that the more that you exercise, even pumping iron, will increase your muscle bulk and therefore your metabolism and allow you to feel better, stay more fit, and even eat that Krispy Kreme if you want from time to time. And get rid of the, self, the, the, the negative self-talk. There you go. Okay. Dr. Resnick, we're going to have you back over and over again. And Absolutely. You're going to keep us informed of all the new research that you're doing at UPMC. We've Thank you delighted. very much. Thank you. Hey, how about a vacation to make you feel younger? Coming up, we're going to find out why river cruises are becoming the hot new vacation destination. That's next on Life Quest. You know, mention a cruise, and most people think about, oh, those big, huge ocean liners. But what is becoming more popular are the smaller luxury vessels cruising down the rivers, like, well, the Rhine, the Danube, the Thames, and something I had never given much thought to until Diane Moore of the Travel Company explained why so many people love this kind of vacation. Diane, I got to tell you, and I did say this right up front, I said, when you mentioned river cruises becoming so popular, I said, okay, but that's not for me because it sounds like they're very slow. And I've seen those, those river boats that come into Pittsburgh that go down the Ohio. And you quickly explained that that's not what you're talking about. That's right. It's a new generation of river vessels that are now being built specifically for certain rivers of the world. For example, um, the Danube has different requirements mm -hmm. than uh, some of the other rivers, so you, you would build one specifically for that. And it's now upscale with all the amenities you would expect. So it's, it's modern conveniences and the entertainment and the expectations of the cuisine and the experiences, enriching experience, exceed your expectations of what it could be. What are some of the most popular destinations in Europe? You mentioned the Danube, the Rhine, um, what else? The Danube for sure because it cuts through at eight countries of Central Europe, and and you you're at the all uh, at eight off, countries, eight countries, and takes you right to the heart of the city, 
and the big cruise ships often can't do that. That's right, exactly. So you're docked right at the edge of city center of, for example, Russe in Bulgaria, where you get off mm. and you put your shoes on, and running shoes on, and go and do and discover, either on your own or with a tour guide, and experience a whole different culture that you normally would probably not get to. And I hadn't thought of this, that, that, that you cruise at night, so they bring you a new city every morning. So it's not that, that slow, you know, that, that you're sitting watching grass grow. That's right, exactly. You cover actually more ground easier, more countries easier on the rivers than you can on the land. For the reason that it's a calm, there's hardly any traffic, and it's easy to maneuver. And nobody gets seasick. Not at all, there's no chop. How about the food? How about the accommodations? Uh, nice? Compar They're, comparable to a, a big ocean-going cruise ship? It, it's comparable, but without the uh, overabundance, let's mm -hmm. say, because what they do is tailor it to the area you're at. They want a culturally enriching experience. That's part of the reason you go there for the, for the cultural um, uh, development of, the, of your experience. So they'll bring uh, entertainers and performers on board and then match the food to where you've just been. I think you brought some pictures along, so let's put them up on the screen and get an idea of what these these vessels look like, and they are luxury vessels. They are indeed. Ceiling to floor, windows, um, beautiful appointment to furniture, um, elegant dining rooms. Um, um, and it, oh no, that gives you an idea of how, how close you are. Exactly. You're not far away. You're seeing castles and monasteries and grand cathedrals going by your window. And, and oh, lovely. So you look are, at that. Now where would that be, do you? That's probably in Central Europe. Mm. Uh, not too many people in these. Uh, you said some of them have uh, as few as 20 people? As few as 20 for, for the, the shallow and narrow rivers and up to maybe 200 or a little over 200 for some of the, the deeper, wider rivers and locks that can handle that. Any big good deals right now for maybe next summer? There are. Uh, there's all kind of a, a early booking um, um, bonuses for you to take money off, discounts, if you'll book and deposit now for your summer and fall vacation. Um, cost, how does it compare to, I'm gonna reach over because I just wanna let my viewers see, I had asked Diane, I said, well, could you show me something that might give me an idea of what's out there? And this is what she sent me. So you see, I have my little post-its in there, and so you know who's thinking about maybe taking one of these trips. But each one is different, and, and some, of the, uh, some of the vessels are really luxurious. They are. Um, you'll have some of your spa services on board and some of your um, um, uh, oh, we all gym like activities. Spa we do. We so services. do. That's right. Um, and then other ones are, are, and again, depending on the size and the river that you're on, have just a very beautiful dining rooms and, and uh, areas where you can meet. Because you're small, you are able to have a camaraderie with these people and you have like-minded people with you. So it's easier to develop friendships. So you have meeting areas after you've come back on board. Do you have packages? that would include airfare and so on? There are. They're negotiated airfares to go with these river vessels and their cruises throughout Europe. And also, not to forget the, the Yangtze River. This, the best way to see the heart of China is the Yangtze River with a boom in, in um, an exploration of, of China. A and the longest river in the world is the Nile. So to see the pharaohs and the pyramids on the Nile. Uh -huh. This is all river cruising. You're, you're making it sound very tempting. And you've taken <laughs> one of these? I have. I've done the, the fjords of uh, British Columbia. It's an extraordinary situation. I've done a lot of research in a lot of the other ri rivers of the world, too. Okay. Uh, Europe is big for this coming spring and summer? It's going to be very, very big. And I do, it, it's just way ahead of schedule for pre-booking. And you have been out there talking to a lot of people, and you say that this is really capturing a lot of interest these days, the, the river cruises. And, and we never really, at least I didn't, I never thought of it as a, a, a really nice way to see a lot. I think because it's brand new in a lot of people's minds and they don't really have the right image of it, that they think maybe it's maybe the old barges or the old uh, <laughs> slow, uh, yeah. almost not in motion kind of a vacation. It's sort of not adventure, but you can do golfing. You can, you can have pre-arranged golf times Summer in your theme, golf club. Theme, theme tri trips. Cycling is big, um, as well as classical music and some of the more cultural ones. But you can do soft adventure on these, too. Well, I think we've told our, our viewers enough to whet their appetites, and uh, Diane Moore from the Travel Company is right there to tell you more whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Diane. Coming up next, well, it looks like a trip to the Super Bowl for the Steelers is going to happen.
have to wait for another year. But that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of Steeler stuff out there to talk about. Author Jim O'Brien is next on LifeQuest. Okay, it may be a disappointing season for the Steelers, but that doesn't mean that the fans are still not loving that team, and there's plenty of Steelers stuff to talk about. And that just happens to be the title of Jim O'Brien's newest book. And Jim, just as sure as day follows night, we know that every year you're going to come out with a new book. And I like the story you told me about how you came up with the title. Yes, the last couple of years when I'd be sitting in front of a bookstore, in the malls, and there'd be other Steeler paraphernalia around me, perhaps some other Steeler's books. Little kids would come by with their parents, and they'd stare over, and they'd say, look, Mom, Steeler's stuff. Yeah. And then mothers would tell me when they were getting a book from me, they said, I talked to my son in Atlanta or Miami or California or whatever. And I said, what do you want for Christmas? He said, just Steelers. get me some Steeler stuff. Well, so this well, is what well, he means. there's his Steeler stuff. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about the book, but let's talk about that team. Come on, nobody knows the Steelers better than you do. A little shaky this year. Right? I think they were spoiled by success. I just you don't think, think it's that Super Bowl hangover? Uh, Super Bowl hangover. It's to be understood. And people in Pittsburgh, they're spoiled. And the Steelers are spoiled. Right now we have to find out if the Steelers are a better team and if we have better fans because it's easy to be a fan of the Steelers. People say, oh, I was a big fan during the 70s. <laughs> wow, they won four Super Bowls. It's easy to be a fan. If you're a fan, just like if you're a parent, when your kids do something or there's some difficulties you love or setbacks, them anyway, you yeah. love them. Mm -hmm. And I think my book, first of all, will remind you that this year, 2006, in February, the Pittsburgh Steelers were thought to be the best team in the National Football League. So you want unconditional love I think, from well, the fans. I think, well, I grew up with the Steelers of the 50s and the 60s when you didn't even, there weren't playoffs. And you didn't think that the Steelers were ever going to win a championship, but they were our Steelers, and we love Bobby Lane and Ernie Stotner and Fran Rogel and John Henry Johnson. Oh. And if you know those days, you'll really realize how lucky we've been well, in recent years. But I know so well those days in the 70s. I mean, those guys, I mean, come on. Lynn Swan and Franco Harris and Terry Bradshaw and Jack Ham. And I mean, you know, that, that, was, that was a dynasty that just went on and on and on. And I think that's what the fans expected this time. Right. Well, it was easier to keep a team together in those days. And, and now it's not. You lose players. You lose important players. That's one thing. And then who would have known that Ben Roethlisberger, the star of the team, uh -huh. was going to have such a challenging year at the age of 24 in which there was one calamity after another. Eleanor, I had to keep adding chapters to this book, Steelers Stuff, because just when I thought I was finished... <laughs> he would come up, he something would, else, his appendix burst, Something right? else yeah. happened to him. <laughs> and I try to explain, what do you think Bill Cower was like when he was 24? What, what is, was I like okay, when I was 24? Bill Cowher, a lot of people are saying, hey, he just doesn't have the fire in his belly he once did. I don't think... Do you think, he's gonna, do you think he's going to leave? No. I think Bill Cowher will be back next year. I know most of the media are saying otherwise. I think he'll be back. I think people ought to realize that we have a coach who's going to be in the Hall of Fame someday because of his outstanding record. He's won a lot more often than he's lost. And this, the other thing is, is that losing, as the Steelers are losing this year, it's part of the theater of sports. You don't always win. You don't always uh, do as you're predicted to do. 
and it's how they deal with this situation that's going to be interesting. I, I look for them to be improved during the second half of the season. They've been this close in the first half, but that can, coach, that can cost a coach's job being that close. But I think they'll be better. And one thing that I can point out to you, and it's, if you read Steelers stuff, you'll be assured of this, and that is these are not the most difficult days of these young men's lives. You will find in Steelers stuff stories about their childhood and their teen years uh. in which they were severely challenged in many different ways, sometimes with something like diabetes or epilepsy, sometimes with trouble in the streets, sometimes with the death of a parent, which has happened to Roethlisberger, his mom died when he was young, and in the case of uh, oh, Aaron, the Smith. One, Aaron Smith. Aaron Smith, I read the chapter that you wrote about Aaron Smith and it touched my heart in such a special way. Uh, maybe if you can just give a brief synopsis of that story, but he did say something interesting, and, and he came, it was a rags to riches story, and he said, you never really know that you're poor until you go to college. He, he didn't know they were poor, even though they lived in a trailer park. Right, and I think that was probably my own experience growing up in Hazelwood and going to University of Pittsburgh. Someone said to me, what was the first thing you learned at Pitt? I said, I learned that a soup spoon comes up, that you can yeah. lift it up. You well, learn all those you know, that's things. true of all of us. I always thought, I always thought we were really rich, and we weren't really rich. I just thought we were. Well, then you were rich. No. Well, in your own way, I never had rich. a bicycle, Jim. We'll do another story But I tell that. people that these Steelers of the 50s and 60s were just as rich as these players. These players are making a lot of money. Sometimes that causes them problems because many of them come from have-not situations, which was the case with Aaron Smith. Trailer camp in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A father named Harold Smith, who was 6'4", 250, suffered with diabetes, didn't take proper care of it, was an angry man, and took ah. his anger out on his oh, wife he and his abused, children. abused, abused childhood. Right. The, the child abuse was terrible, and, and, and that wasn't the end of it. But it was physical child abuse in regard to hitting him, striking him. Right. Aaron Smith slept with a baseball bat under his, his pillow head. for fear that his father might come after him at night, and before he would go to bed at night, he would tell his father how much he loved him because he oh, thought it might hold his father off. But, but, but it chilled in my spine when I read that. Every night he would say, I love you, Dad, right. because he thought maybe right. he wouldn't be beaten. And he said in the book, um, or you wrote in the book, that he, he, he's a good father, he's a good husband, and he said, sometimes I come home at night and I'm so tired, and the kids will say, let's get down on the floor. And he said, I can hardly stay awake, but I get down on the floor. Right. Aaron Smith, I was told, was crying before a recent Steelers game when the players start talking about what they needed to do. And more importantly, I have seen him recently at fundraisers for the Holy Family Institute on the north side and for the Auberly Memorial Foundation in McKeesport, helping to raise money. And what do they do? Both of those places look after neglected and abused children. So this is what Steelers stuff is also about, how many of the Steelers are helping out with breast cancer, with uh, uh, diabetes, with epilepsy, to help others because they are the kind of people who will attract others and they can help raise money and I think that's uh, don't get down on your Steelers these are pretty good guys and that's why I wrote about them we love them Heinz Ward what just his face is just his face is a joy to watch well Heinz Ward was ashamed of his mother who was South Korean and uh, he was of a mixed marriage his father was a black army s sergeant uh, similar to the Frank O'Hara situation and he was embarrassed about his mother when he'd go to school, but he learned how much of a sacrifice yeah, right. his mother made on his behalf and how she worked so hard. Three jobs to make things work. And now, of course, this year he took his mother back to South Korea and they were treated like king and queen. Yeah, Jerome Bettis. We really miss him, don't we? We really miss Jerome Bettis, but in my book I have Gladys Bettis telling the story about how she raised Jerome. And she and her husband, Johnny, oh, yeah. they really set rules of the house there were expectations. They kept them busy in the mean streets of Detroit, which have swallowed many young people. Just a week ago, I read a story about a 6'11 junior high school player who was going to college, uh, be, was being heavily recruited. He got shot and killed just two weeks ago. So his mother wanted to keep him busy. And that was my mother, Mary O'Brien's deal with me. You keep busy, Jimmy, and stay out of trouble. Jimmy, so that's why I've written all done, these books. You've done a 
Good job, Jimmy. I mean, listen, Mary O'Brien would be mighty proud of you, and I know she was, absolutely. Uh, some other people that you write about, um, Max Starks, uh, Jeff Hardings. Well, Jeff Hardings, and this is news, he wants to be a minister when he's done playing football. He told me that. J and Max Starks, I love his story. Here's a guy, we went in, in a, on a golf outing, and I sat next to him in a golf cart. Now, he's 6'8", 340 pounds. In one golf cart? Well, I was on the edge. And I did make a deal with him. I said, if you're going to turn this thing over, you must turn it over to the left and not the right because I don't want you on I mean, top th of it. That's me. just a sight gag, just even thinking about it. You were really on the edge. But weren't he's a you? funny guy. But you know what I like? His mother, who ran a funeral home, uh, she insisted that he learn to speak properly, that he use good grammar. She said, it's important that you communicate your thoughts well, that people understand you. And Max is, is such a good speaker. And I think in this day and age, when you have so many of these athletes saying, uh, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, like, you know, and uh, we're, we were more hungrier last year. I'm saying, no, you were either hungrier or you were more hungry, but you weren't more hungrier. Well, you are the bestest. Okay, right. you are the bestest. Well, you aren't and bad either. <laughs> Steeler stuff, it is Jim's umpteenth book. 22nd? 22nd. Okay. Bobby Lane, number 22. Okay, what are we doing for next year? Have you thought yet? Uh, I, I always wait. put him on the spot. I wait. Every and year. now you appreciate what I do, Eleanor. Uh, it's Jim not easy out, out there. there. We're out there in, in, in the malls, right? right? We're out there signing books and loving every minute of it. Steeler stuff, it's, it's a good, heavy book. Thank you, Jim. But easy to read. Good luck to you, thank and you. thank you for coming by. Well, as always, if you would like to have more information about anything you have seen here on LifeQuest, just give us a call, or you can always check out our website. You can reach us at 412-622-1575. Make sure to leave your name and phone number, because we do like to have a way to get back in touch with you. Or you can log on to our website at wqed.org. I want to thank all of my guests for joining me today. We hope you stay connected with us each and every week. I'm Eleanor Shano. Remember the good years start right here. Be well, everyone, and I'll see you soon.